is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dark, Season 1, Episode 2, Lies. In this episode, oh God, where to begin, guys? Where do I begin on talking about this episode? This is some serious shit. This is the kind of thing that makes me rethink everything that came before it. Uh, we, I knew there was going to be time travel involved, but I didn't realize it was just going to happen to people who didn't expect it to happen to them. And also, I just I want to be able to keep track of everything. And I'm wondering if I do need to take notes for this show, because I feel like that's probably going to be smart. Lot, lot to talk about, so I'll get into it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Huge, huge thanks, first of all, to Jill for commissioning this episode. Um, and reminder to anybody who is interested in helping Jill out, because a lot of people have been saying that, like, if you are going to be covering dark, you really need to stay on top of the episodes or else you're going to fall behind enough that it's not going to make sense anymore or that you're going to lose track of things. If you're somebody who's enjoying the coverage and you feel like chucking 35 bucks in to help keep this going steadily so that I don't start to lose track of things, um, you can go to unspoiledpodcast.com slash shop. Most shows, you know, I the two month gap that I have uh, instituted as a maximum is enough. But I could really understand if that would kind of derail this entirely. So just wanted to put that out there on spoilpodcast.com slash shop. Um, Rashawn is here and she's saying to take notes. Yeah, I think I might. Um, and in the chat on this episode, I shared a link to a website called Meta Witches, M-E-T-A-W-I-T-C-H-E-S. And they have spoiler free episode summaries as well as a list at the bottom of the summary that shows you all of the characters you have met so far and who they are related to. Um, and also the photos that they, uh, that are on the wall in that creepy basement that tell you what they looked like when they were younger versus what they look like now. Super duper helpful. So if any of you are interested, I will try and make sure to, post that link in the show notes for this as well, because um, I don't know how many people are listening to this and like following along with watching the episodes at the same time as I'm watching them. I saw some people in the discord chat for patrons saying that they were thinking they might pick up the show just because I'm covering it. Um, so yeah, if, if you guys are finding yourselves a little bit confused at times, you are not alone. I have realized while watching this that I have white guy blindness and almost all of the male characters, except for like Ulrich and Jonas and Eric, but he barely counts. He doesn't even have dialogue. They all look so alike to me that I have a lot of trouble figuring out who is who. I have a suspicion and I'm going to put this out there right out of the gate. I have a suspicion that somebody in this episode that comes up later is Jonas older. The only reason that I think that, and I will s cop to this completely because I just admitted to having white guy blindness is because his nose is really similar. His nose is very angular and distinctive. And I think he's the same guy, just older and way shaggier and like in bad shape versus fresh faced young Jonas. Who's got his, uh, his blush of youth still upon him, as they say. Um, but that's just a theory based on a nose, a nose nose. So anyway, let's get into this episode. And Rashawn's saying, girl, same. I feel better then. So yeah, this guy is the first one that we see. This episode starts off with the search for Mikkel's body. It's been nine hours, it says, um, since he disappeared. And this dude is rolling up looking shady as all get out 
with his old, like, battered suitcase, a big hood over his head. He's very, very dirty. And he's got a uh, backpack on. And I cannot with how bad the police are at their jobs. Guys, this man is right fucking there. There's 30 people sweeping this fucking field. This guy is standing on a ridge in full fucking view and nobody sees this guy i would have been tempted to think that he had like powers to be invisible and wear a veil or something except that he then walks into a hotel and gets a room like a fucking human being what is wrong with these police it really starts to be like i don't know if ulrich is just super impatient and that's why he starts taking it upon himself to investigate things individually or if He remembers that the police were fucking inept about his own brother, and he doesn't trust them to do their jobs properly, and that's part of it as well. It could be a combination. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But um, honestly, between them letting him touch the body last episode and then them not seeing a shady stranger who just came to town, who's like a vagrant with a bunch of luggage – In the woods where the body, like nearer where it was found or where Mikkel disappeared, y'all are bad at this. B-A-D. Get better. Like, seriously. What are you doing? What are you, like, y'all can't be that focused on just staring straight down ahead of you, can you? Is that what, like, whatever. So anyway, this guy looks down and he sees a dead bird on the ground. And it's just the one. We see a lot more later on. This poor little birdie. I feel so bad for it. I feel so bad for all of them. There's something really pathetic about dead birds that, like, I always sort of see birds as being uh, particularly foolish animals. I don't know why. I think it might just come from us saying things like, oh, he's got a real bird brain, you know. Um, But whenever I see them hurt like this, they're sort of, I they're sort of like insects in the way that they'll like accidentally fly into a window and hurt themselves or die. And I always feel like it's just a terrible accident that and they were probably bewildered as, as to what was happening to them. It's just uh, I don't know. So he picks up this bird and it's just a uh a moment where it signals to me dead birds mean something to this guy and not necessarily meaning something as in that it it is like a matter of course, because this guy showing up, I have to feel that he is a time traveler, mostly because it seems like if you are wearing a hood, you are a suspect to me. Like that's sort of how I'm seeing this. If you are wearing one of these outfits that makes you look like the guy that comes out of the fucking cave, then you're a time traveler. Not really fair assessment. He could be just from the next door. Like the town over. I don't know. But the way he just kind of comes up out of these woods like this, mm, I feel like, you know, this guy is a traveler. So anyway, I f- this, this bird gets his attention in a way that I think signals something to him. And I don't know what that means. And the fact that there are so many more dead later, I have to think that's going to be very significant to him personally when he finds this out um so then we have jonas waking up and he is sweating and has had a nightmare again um and i have to point out how many illustrations and or photos i'm not quite sure which are on the wall around his bed of the woods honestly creepy like i couldn't sleep with that shit hanging right there but, you know, more power to you. And he wakes up and he looks in the mirror and that dark, oily sort of ink substance starts pouring out of his ear down his neck. And he hears his name and he looks in the mirror and his father is standing there covered in the same stuff um, as he was in the woods when he came across him really strange can't figure it out is it toxic waste or something like because there's this whole thing going on with the uh the nuclear power plant factoring into this somehow and i don't have any clue what toxic waste from nuclear power even looks like 
Is it black like this? Is it bright green? Does it glow? Does it just look like sludge? Girl, I don't know. I have no idea. So I've got no real theories on this, but it turns out that it's not actually happening and he wakes up again. So now he's having those fucked up dreams. Have you guys had these where you dream that you woke up and do, did all kinds of shit? I swear to God, I have had terrible nightmares that I would prefer over those kinds of dreams. Having a dream that you woke up, did all of your bullshit like brush your teeth, take your vitamins, drink your coffee get dressed, go to work, and then waking up and finding out that you haven't actually done any of that yet. Like getting yourself moving at the beginning of the day is to me the worst part of the day. I hate waking up and thinking I've, find, I've gotten through the worst part and figuring out that I didn't and that it was all a dream and an illusion. Oh, the worst. So having this sort of thing, even worse you know, and his dad being there, like, oh, it's, the, it's just, I hate it. So we go to the autopsy of this little boy that we found that we thought was Mikhail, who nobody can identify. And they're talking about the burns around the eyes. This body, guys, honestly, it is incredibly unnerving. Like, I just don't think I have come across something that manages to be quite this gory without blood because this is a burn you know so it's a whole other animal to things like that we've seen in the past and um, I just you know it's it's a small child which is uh, right there really horrible you have to think that this kid did not know what was happening to him because it doesn't seem like Eric knows what was happening to him. Um, and I just, the, the intensity of the damage is such that it's like eaten into half his skull, you know, like it really, this burn goes really, really deep and there is something about that more than just it being a burn on his eye area, which is already horrible, but that there is like this extra, there, there is a feel to it that whatever cooked part of his face continued to do so for a minute before it was actually turned off. Like he was dead already and it was still going either that, or it is so intense that it happens really quickly, but it still has the same like deep effect to it. I don't know. But either way, it's it's horrifying. And this woman who is doing the autopsy, um, it's uh, remarkable to me that people are able to talk about something this upsetting and be sort of disengaged. And I'm not like throwing shade at the woman for being disengaged. That's how you have to be right to be able to do your job. I'm just saying that it is a really particularly grim, unusual situation that she seems sort of unflapped by. And I don't get the impression she's seen this before. So she is just level headed in a way that I just can't imagine being. And she describes that there are these little things in your inner ears. Um, she says both eardrums have been completely blown out. And Charlotte, the, um, the investigator, she is saying, was that from a really loud sound? And the Emmy says, well, it could be pressure caused by a nosedive or intense rot rotation the rotation such as centrifuge do you know what autoconia are um tiny grains in the ear canals that help us differentiate between up and down they can get confused when the body rotates for example we lose our balance with this boy none of the grains are where they should be so that's really interesting like is it 
are they being spun somehow? Is that confusion of where and when? I mean, there's talk in in the background of like black holes and stuff. Are they being sent through some sort of wormhole? But then the damage across his eyes is such that it would be, I mean, it seems like whatever machine they're being put in, they stay in the same place. This damage isn't going all the way around his skull. It's located solely across his eyes and like his ear area generally, but not like, so it doesn't seem like the spinning is literal. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's just so weird. So we cut then to, um, oh God, this burn, like they close in on the body again and it's just so horrifying. Um, we go to the, uh, crime scene and we have Ulrich still in the caves looking around and he is calling out to Mikkel. He's alone and all he has is this flashlight. Can we talk real quick, guys, about this show's use of sound? I mean, it is really, really unsettling. I have started to discover for myself that I am affected by sound in a deep emotional way more than almost anything else. Um, Visually, that for sure, but sound does something else. And this show is loaded with these little stingers of like, like things like this, or just a boom in the background. Like there's a constant feeling of things watching of someone just off camera. That's like making a sound of presence in a room other than the character we're actually looking at. I don't know how they're, they're doing it. Like I can't put my finger on every instant, but there is such a, 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 a sort of like dread that they build with the sound effects and the music that is, it sort of makes me want to tear my own skin off because it's so hard for me to like sit still at times, you know, like these, he's in the cave here. I was losing it. I was so sure there was going to be a jump scare or something. You know what? There's not, there's no jump scare. There's nothing there. He finds a door. It is 100% just cave and a door that he finds. That's it. But I was on the edge of my seat, losing my shit. And he winds up bailing. Because, of course, he assumes that since this door has the, uh, the what is it, not radioactive symbol, but sort of like a waste symbol. Um, it's the one with the fan. I don't even remember exactly what that symbol stands for, if it is radioactive or if, but it is to him a signal that this is part of the uh, nuclear power plant, that this is like a trap door into a part of the plant. Now it's understandable why he thinks that, but I don't buy that. That's the whole story. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, if this was here before the plant was, or if it was like this symbol was simply meant to indicate there is some equipment here that's dangerous, but not necessarily that there is a, a connection to the plant at the same time we see this other dude who I think is named Alexander and he is in charge of the plant. And he's the one that's sort of like talking to Eric's father and being weirdly like menacing. He says that they need to get something out of here before they find it and wants to have Eric's father be in charge of moving whatever this is. It could be that they're simply not disposing of the waste properly. It just might be that the symbol is here 
because this is storage for waste that's illegally being kept in these caves and they are not supposed to be. I mean, that's a really boring human reason, but it's certainly possible. And I, I feel like Jill's here. Hi, Jill. I feel like and this is just a gut instinct that they're trying to make it seem like Alexander is part of a conspiracy with this time travel. And in fact, it is something much more mundane. I just don't really think that he is part of this. Um, I don't know why. I don't. I, it, he just seems too ordinary. And there's something about him that feels almost like um, like a mobster. Like the way that he sort of is able to be above the police. They want to get a, a search warrant to go and search this cave and like get through this door. And because it's in a high security area, he can literally just say no. And they can't get in. Like the judge, they they have to go above this guy's head. And doing that takes time and is just... The fact that he can turn them away is kind of shocking to me, you know, like, so there's something about him that, that makes me think he is very shady in a really ordinary way. And what's going on that's like supernatural to, um, uh, to a certain point, actually, it doesn't have anything to do with him at all. Um, so anyway, we have so much to get through. I'm sorry. Um, all right, so the what is uh, Ulrich's oldest son's name? We have Mikael, who is his youngest, who disappeared, um, and then his oldest son is uh, I can't remember his name, and he is interested in oh that's right, um, Magnus, right? His name is Magnus. His sister is Martha. Uh, oh, Jill says Mads. Oh, is he Maz? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking at this thing and I'm trying to... Children of Uldric... I think he's Magnus. Maybe they call him Maz for short. I don't know how sh how name shortening works when it's another language. Um. Oh, it is Magnus. Okay. Oh, you meant Ulrich's brother is Maz. He's the one who disappeared. Right, right, right. Okay, that's why that sounded familiar. Because I was like, I didn't think... Because um, I always think Maz Mickelson, so that's how I remember that. But... and And... Ulrich looks a little bit like Mads Mikkelsen. So I put that as them being brothers in my head. Um, they are, he is meeting up with, um, with Charlotte's daughter, um, who is Franziska. She was not supposed to be at that spot in the woods. And he is sort of like, I wouldn't even say that he's suspicious of her. It's more like he's trying to fucking put any pieces together that he can because his brother's disappearance is so inexplicable that he comes at her in this really demanding sort of aggressive way that I feel like comes across initially as as him accusing her. But I don't really think that's what's happening. I just think that he is upset and angry and there are parts of this that he doesn't understand and he's trying to get a handle on all of it um and mickle rhymes with pickle okay i've been saying Miko, but yeah mickle okay um so his confrontation with her is very brief like he kind of gets in her face and wants to know what the hell she was doing there and she says that I overheard you guys talking about Eric and what was stashed in the woods and going there. And I don't, to be honest, I don't really know what I was thinking. And I appreciate that she just says that because that happens. And I think that sort of calms him down is how understandable that sentence is to him. And then she says, and I'm sorry about Mikko. And he stops dead at that point and walks away from her. And it's obvious that like, if this all hadn't happened, he would have been pretty interested in her. She's very, very pretty. She kind of is willing to stand up to him, even though he's vaguely scary in a way that it doesn't seem like a lot of people are cool with doing. But at this point, her just saying that about Mikkel is like, 
enough for him to wander away. He, he just can't handle it at this point. And later on, we see him in his room and he's just punching the wall until his knuckles start to bleed, which, um, you know, it's lucky that he has that spot on the wall that he can punch that is soft because his knuckles start to bleed. And I can only imagine how much worse it would have been if that had been drywall is fist to be right through that shit. Um, so then we go to this weird thing. There's this house in the woods and Charlotte, I figured, I figured this out thanks to the meadow witches listing. Um, this dude who is in the car and who called Charlotte earlier and acted like he wanted to tell her something, but then sort of got frightened and pulled back from telling it. That's Charlotte's husband, which I am just, what? His name is Peter. I totally did not pick up on that from the way they're talking to one another on the phone. It is genuinely like they are strangers. So I don't know if they're split up from each other or what. But he is in this like uh, station wagon outside of a cabin in the woods that doesn't look particularly lived in. I can't tell if he lives here and it's just sort of a sad, like lonely place and he's out here by himself. I don't know if this is like a, a second home that he has come to for some reason. And he is listening on the radio to the news report about them not discovering the body that they're, they're asking for tips on the case. And he starts sobbing, crying like, and, and, Again, there's a sort of feel to this. Like he knows what happened and maybe is guilty. And he, oh, and he's Jonas's therapist, Jill. I didn't even recognize, see, this is what I'm talking about, guys. White guy blindness. I didn't even realize that he was the same guy. Thank you for that. I totally didn't even. Ugh. Um. But yeah, there is something to this that makes me feel like he is, I don't even want to say that he's responsible, although it's clear he thinks he is. I have to say, I don't feel like that's an accurate read. I feel like he's either mistaken or he is overestimating his involvement. I don't know why, guys. I just, because of what we've seen of him there's something that feels like this is slightly misleading that is supposed to make us think that he's like the guy behind all of this and that he's racked with guilt. But the way that this person goes about doing what they're doing doesn't feel like somebody who could be capable of doing this stuff and also have this kind of guilt. I don't think that those two things could go together. I don't think that he could turn off how the emotions that he's feeling here in order to do what we see this person do to Eric later. Um, so I, I don't know. And I don't know about this like cabin out here. Is this supposed to be like where somebody was kept? Is this supposed to like, he's walking with Jonas for their session. Is this his office? Like he's walking in the woods with him later. Does he meet with clients here and then like go out and walk with them if they are feeling like that's what they want to do? Um, maybe this is just his, his office that he's out at, but it's just a really weird, like, moment. There's a lot of jumping around from character to character without a lot of explanation of individual, like, you know. So then we see uh, Ulrich's mother and father. Now, what is going on with them? I, I got nothing here. I really don't. Um, his mom is constantly calling, trying to figure out if he is, um, if he is, if Ulrich needs any help, if there's anything she can do. I don't think we have seen Ulrich reach out to his mother and even tell her that Mikkel is missing. Like she must know because they're listening to the radio, I would assume and stuff. And this is like all over the papers. We see this guy with the newspaper clipping later, but I have no idea how involved he is. Like he, you know, she calls the emergency line last episode in order to get him to come and see her. So obviously this isn't a huge priority for him. His father 
while she's on the phone calling Ulrich is in the other room and he is throwing a sweater into the into the wash that has blood on the sleeve and clearly lies to her about where he was the previous evening. He tries and tells her some bullshit and it's just nonsense. And, you know, she tries to call him out being like, your car wasn't there. And he's like, yeah, well, I had an errand, like all this nonsense. Um, now, could this guy be involved? I don't know. Why would he be? You know, I, I, I really don't know anything about who he is or his history or what he did for a job, anything like this. Um, but yeah, she, the whole vibe of this is real, real shady. And when he like joins the search party a little bit later, um, I believe it's Charlotte that speaks to him and is like, we're going to find him. And he says, maybe, but maybe not. Like, he doesn't seem like he's really holding his breath on that at all. Um, and why would you, you know, it's a weird thing though, that it's two kids within the same bloodline. I wonder if that means anything because like in time travelers way, for example, time travel is like a genetic thing and they wind up finding out that people can do it like sort of, it can be passed down. So I'm wondering if there is something that makes a particular bloodline susceptible to being like to being able to travel um, because it's significant to me that Eric, we see his body later. Eric didn't travel. I don't think it looks like Eric is killed by whatever was done to him with that machine. So what happened like Mikkel at the end is in another time. He is somewhere else. So whatever happened to Eric is separate and different than what happened to Miko, I think. Like, this is my guess. Um, so I don't know if, like, there needs to be a sacrifice of a human body or a human life in order to, like, open a portal or something. And that Mikkel just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and wind up there. Because there's nothing about this that feels premeditated. Like, Mikkel was in the woods by accident. He tagged along with his brother to a thing that really, like, wasn't even supposed to be their deal. He wasn't meant to be out there. And the circumstances of him being separated from everyone just enough feel, like, opportunistic. You know, it doesn't feel like this was... Unless this was all planned by somebody who knew he was going to be there because they had experienced it before. Like this could possibly be somebody who was in that crowd of friends who is a traveler themselves and they remember how it went down. And they're like, there is a moment where nobody is looking at Miko and that's when we're going to grab him. I don't know why you would though, because he gets sent into another time and he's not fucking aware of what's going on and he hasn't been given any tools or any explanation that we can tell. And I don't know if he was in contact with anybody because he doesn't get any dialogue or anything like that. He just comes out of the cave, which that's not where he was when he disappeared. They were out in the middle of the woods. So he comes out of the cave seeming really disoriented and there's no like information about whether or not he like just did he just wake up on a floor of the cave? Did something grab him and pull him into the cave. There was no noise. There was no sound like that. Perhaps there's, you know, we see Jonas with this map that says, where's the crossing? He finds this hidden in his father's workspace where he does all his paintings. And this, it's a whole huge map of the tunnels in the caves. And it says, where is the crossing? So it seems like his father was looking for something was like aware there was something there, whether or not he was aware because he figured it out himself or because somebody told him who knows. But I, I wonder if it's possible that there is an open portal always available. Maybe I'm saying that these people are being killed by this electric chair. I'm assuming to activate the time travel or do something like this. And the way that there is like this tape going on in the background where there's a scientist who's like, it's technically possible, but what would we be willing to do to try? That seems like what the show is pointing towards as well. 
But because the show seems to be pointing towards that makes me mistrust it. I Maybe there is simply a doorway through and this electric chair thing is a completely separate issue. I don't know. Um, anyway, so we go to, um, to Charlotte and she's playing this tape that they find in the Walkman, the little boy's Walkman. And it's the sound of the, uh, music video that was playing in the background when Eric is being put into the chair. So again, here's my question. Because by the time Eric is actually electrocuted, for lack of a better word, when they when they start this machine up, we hear him starting to like, you know, whim- whimper, basically, like he's in pain, like they've started it up. By the time he's doing that, the video that's playing is the one of the scientists talking about the theory of time travel and whatnot. But this was playing when he was being put into the chair. It doesn't make sense to me that this tape of the same song is actually from that moment. It, what it seems like to me is that this happened to somebody while they were listening to this song. Like this, this happened to somehow and that they became like sort of obsessed with this moment and they're trying to constantly sort of recreate it somehow. Um, but this is all my assuming that they placed this Walkman with this tape in it here and that this didn't just belong to this child. And I'm assuming that this child actually time traveled versus being, as the police are saying, simply dressed up in clothing from this era, which is certainly possible. It could be that somebody is trying to time travel and wants whoever is like they're they're attempting to send. They want them to be prepared. And so they are dressing them up appropriately so that they won't stand out when they get to wherever they're supposed to be going. Don't know, though. And here's the thing, this body disappears, or this body appears the same, like, day that Mikkel disappears. So there's a sort of, like, balancing act that feels like it's happening. And similarly, Mikkel appears in 1986, right around when Mads disappears, is the impression that I'm getting. So... Again, it's like there's a switch off happening. And do they have to be like similar ages? Do they have to be related? Is that part of like the deal with flipping to switching between two people that they have to be like part of the same bloodline and DNA or something in order to, I don't know. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what's happening. So we have the conversation with uh, Ulrich and Charlotte where they're trying to get the search uh, warrant. Then we have the conversation between Alexander and Eric's father. Um, and Eric's father is like, you know, I would move the stuff, but you know, the police are watching me. They're all over me. So they might be a, like, they might follow me because they have their eye on me already and see what's going on to which Alexander, in my opinion, rather presumptuously is like, are you blackmailing me? And I'm like, dude, he's just making a good point. Like he's kind of being smarter than you right now. I don't know what you think, but, and he says no. And there's a certain guilelessness to his face that makes me think it's like by even saying that Alexander has sort of given him an idea that he wouldn't be averse to like taking up. But I don't think that's really what he was doing in this moment. I think he's afraid of Alexander and he's just not going to like, he's not going to do that. Um, And we see later Alexander standing out in the woods, watching a bunch of dudes putting some stuff on a truck. And here's the thing. He asks this dude to take care of it, but then he is out in the woods watching them take some things away. I don't feel like this is the same thing. I mean, it might be. But his name is Jorgen. That's right. 
Um, I don't, yeah, I just don't feel like these are the same two things, but maybe they are. I don't know. And Ulrich, because he tries to get into, like, he just tries to go straight up through the front door, basically, and get in to search the, uh, the power plant. And Alexander won't let him in. He gets really, like, sort of, uh, his mind goes into overdrive basically. And he has this like brain wave that the tracks that they found, because there are all these tracks at the site where like around where Eric disappeared there or no, sorry, Mikkel disappeared. Um, there is a set of tracks that seems to belong to a van. And he remembers that the, um, that Jorgen drives the van for the power company and he decides to go and search Jorgen's property. Um, Jorgen lives in a trailer and he has all of these like different sheds and things around. So Ulrich, it's the middle of the night, you know, and he's just trying to find whatever he can. And he starts poking and prodding around and, um, he is, he finds this fucking, uh, trap door and there is a chain attached to it and a sort of like, it looks like it's going to be a head. I don't know if I was the only one that thought that, but I feel like that's low key what they wanted us to think. It looks like it's just a head suspended on a chain wrapped in like plastic. But when Ulrich actually pops that shit open, it's full of drugs. And Jurgen confesses me and Eric were partners and we sold together. And it's just a testament to how upset Ulrich is a, that his son is still missing, but also B that he, uh, doesn't like that. He was disappointed when he thought that he was really onto something. He just drops those drugs and just walks away from it. And he tries to like kind of get in Jurgen's face about where he was at the time. And Jurgen was like, I wasn't working. Like, it's just, he leaves it. And I wonder what's going to happen with that. Is he going to mention it to anybody? Because I mean, he's a cop, but it doesn't really seem like there's in any intention to throw Jurgen under the bus in this way, even though it could be seen as a sort of a uh, uh, motive, you know, potentially for his disappearance. If they were dealing drugs, they're probably dealing with some shady people and who knows what else was going on. Um, but yeah. So anyway, we have this, um, this thing with the guy who comes to the hotel who came out of the woods. He is, really going hard very, very quickly. Like he comes out of the shower and you get the impression that he is just arriving. Like he just got his room and he just got out of the shower. But then when he, he comes out, all of his walls are already covered in all of these strange charts. There's like, even like photocopies of pictures of the moon and labyrinths and weird shit. Um, sort of like theorems and uh, a lot of like coordinates as well. Um, just there's a, a lot of stuff that does not add up to me at all. And he has scars all over his back and he has a scar across his throat as if somebody like tried to strangle him or as if he hung himself. And I don't know if that's part of what happened to Jonas's dad, because he's not supposed to be Jonas's father. I don't think is it, is it supposed to be the same guy? Because there's a reveal to his face when he's standing at the uh, at the hotel counter that made me feel like I'm supposed to recognize him, but I don't, and I don't know if that's just my problem. Or if that's me misinterpreting the way that camera shot was. 
Because for a second, I actually thought he was Peter. I've been mixing everybody up with Peter. Because he's just got kind of a generic face. I wish they would give everybody a little bit more like a of a distinctive look somehow. I don't know how that would even work. But and yeah, he has there's this um, there's a book called like the theory of time or and a journey through time, something like that. There's a key that's like on a um, lanyard that makes it look like it's meant to be like worn around your neck. And he opens his suitcase and there is this really strange device that is covered with all of these gears and everything and looks really like steampunky in its way. And there's no explanation for what that is supposed to be. I don't know. It's really awesome looking. You know, it looks like something out of Golden Compass or something like this. Um, but yeah, no idea what that's for. So, you know, we see him and then later we see somebody else come out of the woods as well um, with the hood on. And I think we're meant to think that that's the dude who got a hold of Eric. And later on, we see Eric being dragged through the woods and he's dead and he has the same scars across his face that that little kid's body did. And I'm wondering if he's going to be like disposed of in some way where nobody finds him or if he's going to be left somewhere that he is going to be found and they're going to start to realize that there is like a weird series of murders happening or Eric could be in another time. Now I think this is still the present, but there's no need to think that I'm just going by that because it's the simplest to, you know, simplest thing to follow. Um, Jill says it takes a while to catch who everyone is. They unveil it slowly on purpose. I think I rewatched season one before season two, and it was so much better because I knew everyone from the beginning. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. This guy, um, I, I guess that I'm not supposed to know who he is like, but whatever the case I didn't. So there, there it is. Um, so briefly, I want to touch on what's going on with Ulrich because, you know, like I said, he gets really angry at Alexander. He calls him like stone hearted. And after this confrontation and before he winds up like, investigating Jorgen's place, he meets up with uh, Jonas's mother and she is trying to, if I don't think she's trying to fuck him right there, but she is definitely like wanting to connect in some way and get him to connect with her. Um, Oh, Jill is confirming. No, you're not. You're not supposed to know. Okay, cool. Um, But yeah, Ulrich is not having it. He is really, really distracted. And she was somebody to just sort of fill the time because he was bored. And he's not bored anymore. He has some shit to do. And she is going to have to look for her reason to live, really, somewhere else. Because it feels like her and her son are not that close. They have a moment that was actually really sweet where her son is talking to her about like, do you think dad was hiding anything from us? And he doesn't tell her about what he found. He doesn't like really open up to her. He sort of tries to like press her to see how much she might be aware of. And she just says, I don't really know if you ever know anybody. And I don't really know that I ever knew your father particularly well. And he asks, did you love him? And she just sort of smiles and doesn't answer. And they get distracted by the uh, lights coming back on. But that look on her face tells me that she is thinking she thought she loved him. And looking back now, she's not really sure if she did or not. Like, that's what I got from that expression. Because there's something about the smile that feels a little ironic. And if there is anything that I have learned over the years, it is that I, it is very easy to mistake a lot of different emotions for love. And now that I am in a relationship where I really feel like this is the real thing, it's so very different and so much purer and so unconditional in a way that I really didn't think I was even capable of. I have to be honest. I have not had this kind of no matter what happens I know I am still going to love him and be willing to do just about anything for him 
I don't think I've ever been here before. And it's a really sort of wild feeling because it makes you sort of realize that like you'd be capable of doing things you're not aware of because this is so much bigger than you. And looking back at times that I really thought that I was in love, it's, I just so wasn't, I really, really wasn't. But at the time I absolutely thought I was, and you could not have told me shit. I would not have heard you. So I kind of got that from her smile is that she doesn't want to tell him, no, I didn't because that's not even the truth either. You know, like it's too simple. No, I never loved him. Like you can think you love somebody. It can be real to you in that moment, even though it's not really real to you later on. What's in the moment is what winds up mattering in the end. A lot of the time, you know, because that determines what you did in that moment and what you did are the lasting consequences. So I don't, I don't know, but yeah, this moment with her and Ulrich is kind of painful because there's a feeling to her reaction that makes it seem like she knew this was coming. Like I said before, when she told him, I love you in the last episode, I said that it seemed to me he and her have done this dance before and that she knows he's not going to say it back and that he knows she's going to say it and make things weird and uncomfortable for a second. And that he just sort of has to deal with it. So I think she knows that he isn't feeling the same way about her. And she was just hoping that maybe she could be a port in a storm for him while he's going through something terrible, but he's not in a place where he just needs somebody to like distract him. He wants to focus on the other thing that's going on and she's not going to help with that. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I like the fact that I even give a shit about their relationship because this is just the second episode and I don't really know them. So why do I care? But I do, I don't know why. Um, so let's see, there's his finding out about the thing and going and searching Jurgen's place. You already pretty much went over all of that. Um, Oh, right. There's the dude who is dragging the body through the woods. This could be his dad, considering that his dad is deciding to just get up in the middle of the night and walk away. And uh, his mother is awake and like Ulrich's mother is awake and aware that he got up, but doesn't let him know that she noticed. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. And this is all kind of dovetailing at this point, like they. Uh, Jonas and his mother are sitting there. The lights just came on. We have um, Ulrich's parents and his dad getting up and his mother being awake and noticing that he's getting up. We have Ulrich coming home after searching Jürgen's place and the like scene between him and his wife where I think she's aware that he's been having an affair, but she also like is in a place where she, um, I won't even say that she doesn't care, but it's just so secondary now, considering that Mikkel has disappeared, that she's just like, fuck it. I'm not even going to like think about that. And she asks him to like, please not lie to her about absolutely anything. Because, you know, if he's been having an affair, he's been lying about some stuff. And I think that she's concerned he's going to keep doing that about this. And that there's like a, a vibe of all right, listen, if you're going to lie about the affair, that's one thing. Don't lie about our fucking son. Don't do that. Even though he hasn't, you know, but she's just kind of preemptively. And I really liked this scene, actually. And I like her. There's something about her that feels really like a survivor. Like she is somebody who is going to be determined and willing to face truths that are hard. And that's not true of everybody. You know, so yeah, I love this. So they're like sort of clutching each other. And this is when the whole like flickering begins to happen. First, we zero in on the cave, which is all marked off because it's like a uh, crime scene at this point. And then we're in what I think is like the front hall of the high school, if I'm not mistaken, because it's got that yellow door, like all trim there is painted yellow. And we start to see all of the lights flickering up and down in this sort of rhythm. And then the hotel has the same thing. The hotel is so creepy, guys. I swear to God. Oh, no, thank you. Um, but all of the lights in the bedroom begin to flicker and they sort of look around like, what the fuck is happening? We just are 
told quickly, this is citywide, townwide. Everybody is experiencing this weirdness. And we jump to Charlotte and she is at the police station and she steps outside and watches all of the lights and then stops dead, emphasis on dead, because there are hundreds, hundreds of these dead birds out here. It's like whatever happened earlier to cause that one to drop dead in the woods, a version of that that was way more powerful sent out some sort of jolt of energy that caused all of these birds to drop dead at once. And it's a weird thing because the number of birds that are right in front of the like police headquarters, I don't know if that's like meant to be all these birds were sitting right in the trees right there and they all fell. Or if something like redirected a group of birds that were mid flight towards the station, it feels like that more to me. Um, And it is just such a creepy scene. Her just standing there, looking at all of these birds. Um, And then we go back to the dude in the hotel room and he's looking at the front page of the newspaper. um, And it says, where, where is Mikkel? And he crosses that out and writes when, and I'm like, Okay, so you know that there's a time travel thing. I'm assuming you are also a traveler. I am not going so far as to say that he himself is Mikkel, but older. I keep theorizing that he's somebody, but older, but that might not be true. He might be a whole separate person. And then we go to the cave and you can see something is different here because the outside of the cave there, the chairs aren't there. There's a lot of like logs that have been cut down that are laying out. And we see Mikkel climbing out of the cave and looking around, seeming very disoriented. Um, And he's like deep in there. Like when he's climbing out, he's literally having to climb like he was down deep somewhere. And he it's like also it's daylight when he comes out and he disappeared at night. So I don't know, you know, if he realized before he walked outside how much time had passed since he disappeared. But he starts to get the picture pretty quick that like at least a a day or an evening has passed. But then he looks around trying to see the furniture and figure out where he even is. And this cave entrance just looks totally different. So he starts to run and runs into town to what he thinks is his house, except it's not really yet. (laughs) Um, and his father, a young version of his dad answers the door. Listen, guys, did they cast well or what? Because you look at this fucking kid and you know, that's Mikkel like, or not Mikkel, uh, Ulrich. And he acts like kind of a dick to him. You're the wrong house fool. And guys, can you imagine what would you even do? If you were like thrown into another time where you have got no resources, he doesn't have money. He doesn't have anybody to contact. Nobody's going to believe that this happened to him. He can't tell anybody. Do you think if anybody jogged Ulrich's memory that he would remember running into a strange kid that was trying to get into his house saying that he lived there? Do you think that he would have any memory of this strange little moment or no? Because I feel like memory can be so strange that way. There are some things that you would never think you'd remember and you in total detail remember. Whether those details are strictly accurate or not, who knows? But it feels very detailed and real to you. And then there are things that are kind of a huge deal. And somebody's like, I can't believe you don't remember this. And you're like, I can't either. You know, I wonder whether Ulrich has any memory of this at all. And his mom, Katharina, is standing there and she's looking at Mikkel in this way, like almost like she's spooked. Like it's more to me than just who's that kid. She's got a look on her face, kind of like she recognizes him or something. And I I really kind of like that, you know, Um, Ulrich, honestly, you could just see what kind of a sort of a douchebag he is. Like, I don't even want to say douchebag that implies that he's cruel 
or something. But he's just somebody who's obviously very confident. He's quite good looking. He has this like motor scooter, which I'm sure in, in high school is like a bit of a deal. And then Mikkel looks down and he sees the paper and it says the 5th of November, 1986. And the title of the headline is Chernobyl half a year later. And poor Mikkel starts to like hyperventilate, which you fucking would, wouldn't you? And this Chernobyl half a year later has to be significant. No idea how. And that's the end of the episode. So I'm out of time. I have a feeling that's going to happen a lot on this show with my discussions of things. Um, but yeah, I am very into this. I really like all of the weirdness and twistiness of this so far. So thank you very much to Jill for commissioning this and for coming to the chat and helping me out a little bit. Um, and thank you to Rashawn for coming also. I hope that you guys are enjoying the coverage. I hope that those of you who have just started watching because I'm covering this are finding this helpful and uh, metawitches.com to get some, you know, help with piecing together who people are. I found that very helpful. People that I didn't have any idea were connected to one another. They were like, that's their dad. I'm like, oh, shit. Okay, thank you. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for listening. And I will be seeing you again next week with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.